Welcome to this video and uh, I'm delighted to welcome back Professor Angus uh, Dalgleish. Professor, welcome and thank you for coming back. Thank you. Now, many of you know Professor Dalgleish and his work is a, a physician, an oncologist, a pathologist, fellow of the uh, Academy of Medical Scientists and uh, a very, very extensively published uh, medical researcher and, and author. And uh, today, today, Professor, we want to talk about your book that you've written, co-written with um, uh, Professor Paul Goddard. Uh, now, this book, I've been looking forward to this since our first talk, <laughs> when we talked about uh, various things like viral origins and COVID uh, goings on uh, a while back. And uh, I must say, it was my main sense reading this was was one of relief. You know, thank goodness someone has put into concise words the the frustrations um, that, that I've been feeling for really for certainly for the last two or three years. But looking back now, you know, for quite for quite some years, really, for the last decade de decade or so. So we'll put the links to that. Do avail yourself of it. Very reasonably priced. Very readable to the uh, to, to the average intelligent lay viewer or uh, literate lay viewer. It's it's, it's absolutely e excellent. And we want to talk about this this morning, if that if that's okay, Professor. A um, few, few ideas, but I wanted to start off with something fairly basic. I mean, what 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 is science? Has it been useful in the past? And because if it's gone a bit wrong now, we've got we've got a problem. So so really, what is science, and how does that relate to medicine? Might be the first thing to to talk about. Well, the first thing about science, it is dealing with the uncertainty. So you are you're, you're looking at a problem and you're trying to work out the cause or, or, or whatever, or in this case where something came from. So you assemble all the evidence and you look at it and perhaps it can be fairly obvious or it suggests one, two or three possibilities. Well, the way you then do, you kind of put those on the table and you say, which of these is the most likely explanation for this? Well, perhaps there is no likely explanation. So you then speculate that this is more likely, A is more likely than B. How can we prove that? So you will uh, construct some experiments or a hypothesis, and the one I like, the null hypothesis, where you, you do your experiments and you, you work out which is the most likely. And uh, I think that this is actually what should have been done with COVID right at the beginning. But of course it wasn't. We now know that there was a worldwide orchestration to shut down uh, the fact that a lot of evidence suggested it came from the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Myself and, uh, and Berger Sorensen uh, were you know, really sure that the changes in the sequence of this did not require actually any further major discussion if people would only look on the table at all this evidence it was as clear to anybody but instead it was pushed under the carpet we were ostracized shut down cancelled everything now that is a death of science because we should have said and i tried to do it i took it to the uh, i gave it to people who gave it to cabinet and the people who should have known better sage etc they should have looked at this and said, this is absolutely true. And, and I've been over it before, but very, very simply, uh, and we weren't the only ones to note this, by the way. So it wasn't like they could say one lunatic crying in the wilderness, just ignore them. There, there was a group from India who spotted the inserts first. And then, of course, they were persuaded they were deluded and to withdraw their observations. I mean, this, this is a non-scientific environment. They were completely right. And in fact, what, uh, what uh, Berger, my colleague, who was looking at it from designing a vaccine, immediately spotted, and he looks at uh, when you want to design a vaccine, especially if you're looking for receptor binding regions, you want to look at how well they fit lock and key. And he spotted what nobody else spotted, and that was that the inserts meant very high charge. And I've referred to this my analogy for that is you uh, wind the virus up, you hypercharge it so it smacks into the door of a fridge maybe. Now, nobody would actually look at that and discuss it. Uh, everybody dismissed it and said, all changes are random. So it doesn't make it and nature can make it random. 
But no, you have to look at random, a lot of random changes that are meaningless. You can substitute a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, the, the basic code. It is what they encode and what they make that makes a difference. And I've been horrified at the number of people, specialists, virologists, immunologists, uh, molecular biologists, uh, who don't seem to be able to grasp that. They just keep reiterating and they follow the code. Now, one of my uh, colleagues kept telling me that, you know, Eddie Holmes was the great genius here and he'd made his mind up that the virus uh, came from a bat somewhere and couldn't possibly have escaped from a virus. And he was the great well, yeah, yeah. Holmes. And therefore, you know, uh, who was I to challenge this, that and the other? Well, we now know this great Eddie Holmes was uh, all part of uh, a, a group worldwide that were inculcated into uh, deciding that they should decide together to dump down everything, even though they had suspicions themselves. And he was one of the authors on this Kirsten Anderson paper in, in uh, Nature Medicine. And I actually pointed out... That, that was the one that said that lab leak theory is a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy theory. I mean, it was absolutely natural. Here it, here it was. And then I was the one, when I read that paper, said uh, that this is the worst scientific paper I have ever read in my entire life. And I was told, don't be there. That, that could possibly be uh, libelous. Well, no, uh, you know, the truth. If you actually point out the truth, it can't be libelous. Uh, uh, well, it's your view. In your view, this was the worst scientific paper you'd ever read. This is the worst scientific You're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> I've subsequently been shown to be completely correct. We now know that everything's been released that they were worried that it may have come to the lab and they decided that they were going to make a political stance that it didn't. So it was lying. It was perjury. And Fauci uh, basically commissioned this. He had a gun at the head, but metaphorically. <laughs> at the head of all oh, this. We hope metaphorically. <laughs> we hope metaphorically. And basically he said, you know, I want that paper in the next few days and we'll get it into Nature Medicine. I believe the initial version of Nature Medicine, there was one or two things. It's all well described in a, uh, another forthcoming book, not by B, but by uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. But it was finally put in and used as the gospel, the Bible, absolute Bible. And then, it's in Nature oh, Medicine, it must be right. It, well, and it was uh, something like 5,000, um, 5,000, 5,800 uh, uh, downloads or something and two or 3,000 um, citations. So along with the other, and I'm very careful what I say here, complete rubbish paper by Dazak and his colleagues in Lancet, which is even more of a uh, concocted uh, put down, saying that this is, they, they implied anybody who suggested leap from the lab was a racist and uh, not in the interest of scientific harmony. Those were the words they used, not interest of scientific harmony. Well, sorry, once you are happy that, that you uh, put forward um, the non-truth as the truth science, it is the death of science. So, so this is what led to us trying to, to capsulate this uh, in this book. And can I just go and say how, how it came about? Please, because please. Been, it came about because I'd been on uh, Good Morning Britain and uh, a few uh, uh, radio programs, etc., and GB News, what have you. And I'd been complaining uh, bitterly, and I wrote in the mail and the telegraph too, about lockdown. And that there, was no, there was never any need for lockdown. It was a travesty, and nobody had thought through what are the unintended consequences of lockdown. So I was contacted by a publisher who said, I'd really like to write a book, uh, you to write a book on this, so let's do it. So I wrote quite a bit of the first bit all about the lockdown and the effects and the effect on the cancer patients, heart patients, etc. And it went, I mean, it went very well. I wrote a few chapters and they said, well, the, the, uh, it's all dying out now. Let's leave it until the next wave. Well, when the next wave came along, I mean, I thought if you carry on like this, when are you going to get it, uh, you know, publish it and, and do it properly? So it was when I was talking to Paul Goddard, who I was, being, I was at medical school with, so I've been in contact ever since, I'm very impressed with his uh, publication uh, track record. I told him of this, and he said, let me have a look. So when he had a look, he said, 
this was perfect for expanding. And he said, let's deal with this A, B, C. And I said, and then he wrote these bits. And I said, you realize that we are documenting the death of science here. And he said, great title. <laughs> and that's how, that's how it took off. And uh, because he'd been publishing a lot of uh, uh, medical books for the last two decades with his clinical press, he said, we'll publish it. Like, we won't waste time trying to get other people to take it on because they'll always find reasons why not. And that is actually true. Anybody who's uh, tried to publish anything, even J.K. Rowling, uh, can list over a dozen times she was rejected uh, before she she got accepted. So that that's what the uh, the publishing world's like. So we feel felt that it was much better to get this out there. And what is interesting is the number of people who've contacted us saying this is a, just like you said. Mm. This is how we've been feeling, mm -hmm. but we've not been allowed to say it, and it hasn't been allowed to be aired in the mainstream media. In fact, I think we'd probably have lost uh, our sanity if we didn't have all these networks that have uh, been allowing us to communicate all these things. It really would have been very, very difficult. But suddenly we realized there were uh, thousands of us who thought like this out there and were prepared to talk. And especially from my point of view, where I was saying that since the boosters came in, I've seen very nasty cancer presentations. And I think this is due to the boosters. I was told to shut up. I've been carpeted by uh, the, the hospital. I've been carpeted and said I'm under investigation by the Royal College of Physicians. And my argument is, well, you should be looking at this, but you shouldn't be carpeting me. You should be carpeting all the people that have been trying to cover it up because it is absolutely a, a real fact. When I first flagged it, I um, put it out there and I was contacted immediately by people, you know, 30 miles away, 40 miles away in Leeds, everywhere. So we're seeing exactly the same thing. And I said, have you tried to report it? And they said, no. I'm sorry, sorry. they said, yes, but we can do nothing about it because we're told it's anecdotal and to be quiet and not frighten the patients. Even my own colleagues said, you're frightening the patients, be quiet. I said, and, you know, my, my response here is very much, I was trained, and when I uh, qualified, I thought my main, main role in life in medicine was first do no harm. Mm. So that's where I was coming from. I was seeing a totally unnecessary booster vaccine was actually inducing a perturbation of the immune response that was leading to a loss of control of the uh, cancer. Mm. 